Um, I think we talked a lot about uh, what it looked like for us, but like, when did we like realize that we had an issue and like, how did you, like, when did you address it? Um, for me, I, it took a long time for me to realize um, it was a lot of just valuing myself and um, I guess like not really realizing the cause of things. Um, and then I guess I probably addressed it in the last like even like three or four years, um, which was um, I guess being like more intentional about things and really um, appreciating things a lot more than just like, I have to do this. Um, and trying not to take like all challenges um, it was a really, I, I thought, I think it was Katie that said this about, or maybe it was Sarah, but like that you're like tough enough. Like, I think we are always trying to prove that we're, we're tough enough. And, um, I was just actually, I think we interviewed Nicole Bush, who's not on this panel, but she had said to me, like, maybe, maybe we are tough enough, you know, like maybe you don't have to prove it every time. And so that like, that's still something I'm learning, I guess. Um, and so I guess when I addressed it was <laughs> more recently than I'd like to admit. Um, and again, like just appreciating things. Um, Katie, how about you? Yeah, I addressed it um, as an adult, really. It took me getting out of the competitive environment. So I ran at Michigan State for five years um, and I had a lot of ups and a lot of really low lows that, mm -hmm. um, you know, now I recognize it's just, just too low. Like I needed help kind of separating my physical injury from my identity as a runner um, mm -hmm. and really helping my resilience, you know, when something went off track, I just didn't have any sort of um, like psychological flexibility to take a day off if I needed it or to maybe avoid an energy deficit. Um, and so, yeah, I was really able to address my mental health slowly and surely as an adult and not even very intentionally at first, but just like, you know, remembering things and that, you know, I would think of in college or um, beliefs I had in college around running and kind of as a, a person outside of running now kind of going, hmm, that's really unhealthy. Like I really believed, I really believed that. Um, so really just examining my beliefs one by one over the years. And, um, I think once I, I, PT is a second career for me. So once I went back to PT school, it kind of opened up, like gave me, started to give me a platform to build from, to think about other runners, physical and mental health. And that has been just a huge introspection for me too. Oh yeah. That's a good point. I, I agree. Like, um, I'm like still kind of like dealing with it because like when you're going through that time it's kind of scarring like it's kind of like a dark moment and I know like when I was going through it like I lost ability like one time I was in a race and I was like in a like relay and I was like the second leg so I the race is about to start but I did not feel right I get down and I lose the ability of my arms. Like I cannot, yeah, I could not even move my arms. So I was like down on the ground. One arm was on my, I was on my elbow and then the other arm I was on my wrist because I couldn't lift myself up and the race had started. So I couldn't even ask for help. So the race started and I got up and I'm running and it like my, after the race, I was fine, but Prior to that, almost every week, I was actually like throwing up almost every week. And so I was like, this is so unhealthy. Do I wanna run or do I wanna like save myself? So like after running, I left it completely. I didn't like, I didn't look back competitively. And immediately after I left, I was not sick. I was not nauseous anymore. It was just like, night and day so I was like I know it had to do with 
the environment that I was in because at first I thought it was physical so I was going to multiple doctors I went to like three different doctors they gave me multiple medications and it just wasn't working and I'm like there's something else wrong and I don't understand what it is and I was really nervous that it was something terminal like what's going on so when you think about am I like tough enough like sometimes that goes off the window it's like is it healthy like is it right for me like do mm -hmm. I want my life or do I stay in this environment so yeah that's what it was for me <laughs> and and I'm still dealing with that because yeah. sometimes when I want to go back to like running it's like flashbacks but you know I try to just push through because it can overflow into other aspects of your life like no just push through in a healthy way you know yeah and those those links that you're talking about between physical and mental health i couldn't have imagined how real they are as a younger athlete i think i maybe would have thought eh, maybe you know um but now like knowing more and you know looking back more those links are just so strong. And if we, you know, look at like overtraining syndrome, 80% mm -hmm. of overtrained athletes have depression symptoms. If we look at relative energy deficiency in sport, um, having a negative energy deficit actually puts you at risk for depression and running related injury and decreased tissue capacity and in all these things. So they, they all exist together. They're, they're inseparable. Yeah, absolutely. And that is so much of what led to my demise in my cycling career. Um, and what was so unfortunate, I mean, I was in my early thirties as a professional cyclist. Um, so you would have, you would think that I would have learned to advocate for myself by then, but no, it was, it was the same bad habits as a younger athlete. And, um, you know, I, I had back-to-back -back seasons with, without adequate rest. I was working full-time still and traveling. I mean, one year I traveled like 30 weekends out of the year to a race. Um, and so was traveling a lot, was working full-time, was going through a divorce, um, and then trying to maintain a, a full training schedule and really fell apart and then like some really bad stuff happened and I finally like hit rock bottom shit was blowing up and I finally decided to tell my uh my team directors about it and they literally said drink that coffee I need you to sign this waiver so I can go pick up your, your bib. Uh, you have a race to do tomorrow. Wow. That's and that was the final straw. Like I'm telling, I'm pouring my heart and soul out to this person who is supposed to be there supporting me as his athlete. And he pretty much just threw it in my face and said, I don't care about you. You're just a machine on my roster and I need you to perform. I went back to my hotel room. I bought myself a plane ticket home and I never race, raced my bike again. And, and now that, that ultimately led to me packing up my entire life in Utah and moving to Washington and never looking back and moved here, found an amazing therapist, did a lot of really hard work. And, you know, I, I can't say that I would want to go back and change my experiences, but I certainly don't want somebody else to have to go through that. Yeah, definitely. That reminds me that, um, you know, a very public example we've had recently of a runner, not only not being supported at a very high elite level, but um, it's Mary Kane. Yeah. That your, your description of, you know, yeah. trusting your coach and coming to them and them supposed to be that person who you can, who can help hold you up is then the person that's just not there for you um, and really negligent with your mental and physical health. Um, you know, I, I, it's not a surprise, you know, I'm so glad Mary Kane came out with that, 
I'm so glad you just shared that with us. And unfortunately, I don't think this is a completely unique scenario. No, and not at unfortunately, all. Like, yeah, like women are put in these situations athletically and it's sink or swim, which it just, yeah. in, in thinking back about my college career, it just didn't have to be that hard. It could have been <laughs> more enjoyable. It just didn't have to be that hard. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. Yeah. I've, I've told this story before, but like, it was like my last race in college. And it was like, I don't know, like a green and white meet or something like that. It wasn't like a major thing. And um, I did my final workout with like Liz and Jenna. Um, and I got done and they were like, Oh my gosh, this is such a hard workout. And I was like, it wasn't a hard workout. Like I was, I wasn't even like, processing it as being a hard workout because like I didn't have all that like pressure anymore like it was my last race I didn't really have to do it it was just for fun and like I had put all of that pressure on myself for so many years that I made it like a situation where I made it harder because I I had placed that pressure on myself and didn't know how to manage it better um and so that to me was kind of like as far as like learning from it was a a point that like stuck with me for a long time, but I didn't actually process it until a while later. Um, sorry, Sarah, did you want to go next? Um, yeah. So my kind of, mo I have like a specific moment where I realized like this could be a major problem if I don't turn myself around real quick. Um, like I never would have said I had any issues with anything. Like I normally, like I didn't care about mileage. I just ran whatever coach said and just did that. Um, I wasn't obsessive about things that came with running. Um, I was pretty healthy in that aspect, but my senior year at nationals in the indoor 5k, um, I was standing on the line. They were going to raise the gun any second. I looked to my left and I looked to my right and I should have thought, you know, like, okay, it's going to be our race plan. It's going to be this, it's going to be that. But my thought that went through my head, I was like, man, I'm the biggest girl on this line. And like, I wasn't by any means, like, I'm not built like those tall, skinny, like stereotypical distance runners that like everybody assumes all the good athletes look like. Um, and I'd never like thought like that before. And um, my mind kind of went blank and I raced the race and it went fine. Um, but like afterwards I kind of sat back and I was like, man, this can be really, really self-destructive if I, you know, don't get help. I don't figure this out or things like that. And like, luckily I had enough education to like realize that I was about to go down that road. Um, mm -hmm. and like I had a supportive, like coaches and uh, teammates and people in my group. Um, so I was able to turn it around, um, with that. I mean, I still struggle with self-image and things like that to this day like I don't know if that's something that really ever goes completely away mm -hmm. until you like kind of step away for a long time um but you know uh, with that uh you know anxiety around I have right now like especially um you know I haven't raced in over a year at this point uh try and have big seasons and things like that and there's a lot of anxiety about getting in shape with a new team new coach wanting to make everybody proud fit in um and that's something new that I've been struggling with probably in the last like four or five months. Um, and luckily um, with getting a master's in sports psychology, I've been able to make connections and actually see sports psychologists about it. Um, and it's one of those things that you don't realize a lot of people do because no one will talk about it. So you don't realize that's really an option um, until you I don't know, talk about it but no one talks about it. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's that simple. <laughs> um, but that's kind of my experience. Um, I've been, I mean, I'll say it over and over again, I've been super lucky with people I've had in my corner. Um, and doesn't mean I don't struggle. Doesn't mean I won't in the future. Who knows what it's going to entail. But um, yeah, I think surrounding pe yourself with people who are willing to work with you and understand and help and finding the connections you need to get help. Um, really makes careers or breaks them, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Like, especially if like you can have someone who fights for you because mm -hmm. for me, it wasn't necessarily like the pressure like I myself was putting on myself. It was a lot of like outside pressures that were happening within the system. And 
I even had someone tell me that I should act a different way, you know, in front of the starting line, like, oh, you need to be more aggressive at the starting line. I was like, no, I do things my way. My way is good enough. My way got me here. <laughs> so mm -hmm. like I would ask for help um, from multiple different people, but no one wanted to help. No one saw like an issue or stood up or saw that something was wrong when I asked like, hey, like I need help, can someone help me? I need, uh, something's not right, or can you fix this? And it was just blown over. And if you have someone in your circle that knows you and knows that like, hey, something is off, um, let's talk about it. Or when you tell them like, hey, something is not right and we need to fix this, they will stand up for you. Um, it makes a complete difference for sure. Yeah, I completely agree, Erica. I, mean, I I had nobody in my corner. And even when I was very visibly falling apart, everybody all of a sudden, all, I left my I left my team. Not a single woman from my team reached out to say, hey, are you okay? That is how toxic that team was. And a, every Everybody would say, oh, we're family, blah, blah, blah. No, no, that was, that was false. Yeah. They were just like, oh, well, she's being dramatic. Are you kidding me? What, why would I make right. these things up? Why would I completely self-destruct in front of everyone? I, I don't want that kind of attention. I want help. Completely agree, Erica. You need people in your corner. Right. Which makes um, also, like, there may have been, like, for me, there may have been someone that wanted to be there, but that didn't know how to be there either. So if you can find the right people that know how or understand mental health to help you better, that can help. But I agree with you, like, when I came to someone and I said, hey, there's a problem, no one reached out to me. No one said, hey, did you fix this, this, did this um, problem solve? Or did you get it handled? Or let me try to help you out to get it fixed. So they should have known something and took you seriously and definitely reached out to you or so, you know, something should have been yeah. done. I mean, it makes me so appreciative of people like Sarah who have such a great education and great insight into what it is like being an athlete and you know we need more people more coaches like Sarah out there in the world mm -hmm. uh being mentors and uh, you know being that support system for young athletes so thank you Sarah you're welcome <laughs> I try my best <laughs>